We all have different opinions, and that's the beauty of cycling. You can express yourself by the rig that you ride. But as cycling evolves and bicycles evolve, so does the terminology, technology, and standards. Last month, we asked our viewers to vote on whether a variety of the most popular new bike trends were worthy innovations or just marketing hype. So in this video, we are going to talk through those results and share our thoughts on the matter. Plus, if you signed up for our giveaway, stay tuned to the end of this video where I will announce the three winners. Let's do it. So if you missed out on this giveaway, make sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell so that you don't miss out on any future giveaways. We had over 2,000 people participate and I just wanna say wow and thank you. Also, after drafting my notes and actually recording the first video, I realized it would be far too long to fit into one video. So instead, I decided to split it into three videos with this uh, particular video being around hub spacing, wheel size, and tire width. Let's start with these little things, through axles. Until about the 2000s, most bicycles used QR skewer axles. These are skinnier, they're steel, they have a lever, and they fit in open dropouts. Then somewhere around 2010, someone, although I can't really figure out who it was, maybe just the bike industry as a whole, thought it would be a good idea to make thicker axles that would thread into solid through dropouts. The idea was to create a more consistent and secure wheel install, consistent brake alignment, less drag, and a stiffer ride. So the results for this one were pretty clear. 87.8% .8 of you thought that this was a worthy innovation, 7% of the votes had no opinion, and 4.9% of you, or roughly 100 folks, voted for marketing hype. Now I know there are certain rigs where beautiful quick releases work really well. And many of these have gotten much more stiff and more efficient, like the Paul QR skewers. But to go back to ploys versus innovation, it seems like the bike industry, both frame builders and fork manufacturers, have gone away from QRs mostly because of the inconsistency when installing and the time and effort it takes to remove the wheel, not to mention how easy it is to lose these little springs on the end. It's frustrating. Through axles not only are helpful for people just getting into riding, but it also makes more sense on a variety of levels, including alignment, stiffness, and simplicity. Now there are some downsides, of course, with through axles. Some of them do take a bit more adjustment, especially those axles that come on Fox Forks. There's also no real set standard with thread pitch and length. Yes, you will still continue to see the quick release axles, especially on more budget bikes because they are cheaper than through axles. But ultimately, I think the through axle was a great innovation and there's definitely more pros than cons. All right, I just wanna take a quick moment to let you all know that this video is supported in part by Terravel Tires. Like many cycling brands, there's a passionate group of cyclists behind Terravel. Their tires are designed and inspired by routes and terrain they've ridden. And that's why you may notice their tire models are named after regions with distinct terrain and even specific trails in some cases. So to learn more about Terravel's development process and a bit more about their tire models, you can click this card right here and I also have a link in the description below. All right, so next up is Boost Spacing. Boost spacing has been around actually for a while, since 2015. And it's become the predominant hub spacing on mountain bikes, I'd say over the last handful of years. But why did we land on 148 millimeters? In general, bikes needed help creating more tire volume, better chain lines for these big 11 and 12 speed cassettes, while also creating a stiffer ride. So despite the 157 millimeter axle spacing that was already being used on downhill bikes, Trek, in partnership with SRAM, launched the 148 rear spacing, which adds three millimeters on the disc side and three millimeters on the drive side. So folks were a bit more on the fence about this standard. As 41.3% voted in favor of the standard, 231 think it's marketing hoopla, and the remaining being a big chunk had no opinion. So the results here are really interesting. And from a few folks that I've talked to in the industry, this just might have been the biggest marketing push on this list. But first of all, if you don't know what you're looking at or trying to feel, the additional spacing from 142 to 148 might be less important than some other technologies. 
in this video. But the addition of six millimeters has opened many doors in the bike world and bike geometry. By widening the hub flanges, you are essentially creating a stronger and stiffer wheel as spoke angle is larger. This also creates more space for tire volume and gives you a 52 millimeter chain line which aids in 1x11 and 1x12 speed drivetrains. But the problem here is that do these improvements actually help enough and do you recognize them? And why didn't the industry just stick and adapt to the already available 157 millimeter spacing that was currently around? All right, so let's talk about Super Boost. And I feel like people are getting excited and also frustrated at the same time. So 135 QR, 142, DH 157, 148 Boost, and now 157 Super Boost Plus. As I hinted in the last topic, 157 millimeter hubs have been around on downhill bikes for a while. But the big difference here is those hubs shared the same hub flange measurements as a 135 or 142 millimeter hub. While the new Super Boost hub flanges is wider than today's 148 Boost flanges. Companies such as Pivot, who first started using Super Boost back in 2016, and DaVinci, Evil, Salsa, just to name a few, have all adopted Super Boost on many of their full suspension mountain bikes. Those brands above might not be too stoked on this number, but only 123 people, or 6.1%, voted that it was a worthy innovation. Nearly 50% of voters thought it was marketing hype and the other 45% had no opinion. So since we just touched on boost spacing, let's talk about the differences between the two. Obviously with the wider hub flanges, you have an even greater angle on the spokes, which creates an even stiffer wheel than say Boost 148, which engineers have found useful on e-mountain bikes, longer travel 29ers, and in general, more in line with the insane riding abilities of folks these days. This tech has also given engineers more leniency with the chain stays, giving them more tire and mud clearance while still maintaining a short chain stay. By stretching out that back end, it does mean that the cranks or rather Q factor need to be widened to accommodate a 56 millimeter chain line. So from bike to bike, you may notice some heel interference. To me though, Super Boost is very dependent on the type of bike you are riding. However, if the marketing dollars were spent on Super Boost and not Boost in 2015, this would have been the more popular standard. Both have their pros and cons, but I would argue that Super Boost does give you a bit more to work with. But what do you all think? 27.5 or 650B, B, 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 B650B has actually been used for a while. Back in the 1930s, the 650B balloon, also known as 26 by one and a half, became popular in France for randonneurs, loaded touring bikes, and tandems. However, the 650B size never really caught on in the United States. That is not until recently when Kirk Pacinti started designing bikes around the wheel diameter in the late 2000s. Positioned in between the 26er and the 29er wheel, Kirk thought that 29er bikes were compromised because the bike's geo had to drastically change to fit the larger size. He used 27.5 size to gain the benefits of the larger wheel while still being able to use the proven geometry of a 26er bike. Although things have drastically changed since then, the logic was sound. We'll touch on 29ers next, but 27.5 is just not as popular. With 61% of you considering it a worthy innovation, 22% voting for marketing hype, and the rest had no opinion. Today, 27.5 bikes have had a big influence in the downhill world, but also the drop bar category. For starters, the overall wheel size does give you a more nimble feel, and because of the smaller diameter wheel, it allows you to kind of turn over the bike with more ease. The smaller diameter is also easier to accelerate, and because of its reduced size from the 29er, it is lighter in weight. Another benefit is that by reducing the diameter, you can actually increase the tire volume, and more volume tends to mean more comfort especially as it pertains to a drop bar bike. But I would say the biggest benefit to this point, in my opinion, is that it enables size specific scalable geometry for smaller riders. So while 27.5 wheels are really not for me, and I will touch on this in the next segment, I do think there is a place for this wheel size and I don't see it going away 
like the 26er did. So the 29er wheel. The 29er game was not necessarily an innovation, but rather the development of larger volume tires to fit a 700C wheel. 700C and 29-inch wheels have the same 622 ISO. ISO is the standard that measures the inside wheel diameter. So as mountain bikes started to gain traction, the 26-inch wheel became the dominant wheel size. However, in 1999, WTB produced the first 29er tire in the Nano Raptor. While it was slow to get going, similar to its riding characteristics, it was the start of 29ers taking over as the dominant wheel size, which happened more than 10 years after WTB took that leap. Took a while. And for the most part, you all are pretty happy with this innovation with 88.9% of you voting that it was a worthy innovation and only 47 stating that it was marketing hype. Because of its commonplace in the bike world, most of us have likely pedaled the 29er and have understood its characteristics by now. It is indeed slow to get going, but once you do, it maintains momentum better than any other wheel size. Its larger diameter also creates better rollover abilities versus say the 27.5 or 26 inch wheel. And at higher speeds, they have stability that is hard to replicate on any other wheel size. Obviously the downsides here are where 27.5 wheels excel. It's more difficult to maneuver these wheels in tight twisty trails, especially for smaller riders, which is why 29ers are a challenging wheel size for shorter riders. But if you can overcome those obstacles, in my opinion, over the long haul, it's the fastest and most capable wheel size out there. And if I had to pick one to stick with forever, right here in 2022, it would be the 29er. Stamp it in cement, boom. All right, plus tires. Last year, I published a video answering the question of whether or not 29 plus was dead. And it seems like there's an interesting dynamic here. Most of the 29 plus users love it and would never let it die. Yet there were manufacturers that were cutting back or even discontinuing tires as a whole. Born in 2012, the Surly Krampus was the first plus tire bike out there. Donning three inch Surly Nards, a tire still available today. Niner, Lens Sport, Rocky Mountain, and others followed with their version of a 29 plus offering. As plus tires evolved, tire and frame manufacturers realized that many 27.5 plus wheel and tire combinations would fit into 29er frames as their measurements were rather similar. And to me, this was the biggest development as the challenge around building a 29 plus bike still to this day marks frustration points for many engineers. I wonder if uh, Super Boost could lend a hand. Given the audience of this survey, I was surprised to see plus tires not do better. Although still an overwhelming positive at 64.2%, over 20% thought it was marketing hype, while 15% had no opinion. I'll be the first to tell you that my ideal tire width is 29 by 2.6 inches. But it took some time to get to this point, testing plenty of plus tires and plus bikes out. And it will likely change again, but why is there still a dedicated plus fan base out there? The biggest upside is volume, and volume equals comfort. And when we talk about bike packing, that's a big bonus. It allows you to run lower tire pressures to accomplish a more comfortable ride quality, plus the big footprint can eat up really anything in sight from sand, snow, and rocky trails. It's sure-footed and reliable, but because of its size, the setup, which is typically consistent of relatively large internal width rims and much more rubber, means that Plus is not light. But folks that love Plus, I don't think are in the same category as weight weenies. To go back to the question at hand here, I see no marketing hype involved with plus introduction. It allowed us to find the limits of frame geometry and clearance. And in my opinion, it has allowed 29 by 2.6 inches to thrive. That about does it for this video, almost. So I didn't actually collect names in the form, only emails. So that wasn't the brightest move I've ever made. But for the sake of transparency, I'm going to share the first four letters of each of the three emails. Um, thanks again for participating and stay tuned for the second video in a few weeks. The first email is jspc dot 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 at gmail.com, chri dot 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 at gmail.com, and rbfu dot 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 
at gmail.com. I will email all three of you with a code so that you can get your Kitspo icon. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, pedal further. Thank you.